afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to our webinar, Disparities in Opioid Deaths. Let's look at the system and not the individual from community science. I'm Maisun Frage. I'm one of your hosts today. And before we get started, we would like to let you know that if you have technical issues, to please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. We'll have time to answer questions at the end of our presentation portion. So if questions come to mind as we go through the content, feel free to add those to the Q&A as well. Andrea Epstein will be monitoring the questions and will also be able to help you with any technical issues. Just to answer a common question right away, uh, all of you who registered for this webinar will receive a copy of the presentation. So in terms of key takeaways, we hope that you'll take away from the presentation today lessons on the role of racism in opioid use disorder, reasons measures of intake and retention are not enough, how to use data to improve systems, recommendations for promoting anti-racism in addiction treatment organizations. We are with Community Science, and Community Science is a research and development organization that works with governments, foundations, and nonprofit organizations on solutions to social problems through community and other systems changes, fostering learning and improved capacity for social change. As I said, my name is Maisun Frage. I'm a senior associate at Community Science, and I'm really happy to introduce my colleague, Anna Ghosh, who will be leading this webinar. We both come from a background in public health and evaluation with a focus on health equity. Anna is a managing associate at Community Science. She has more than 15 years experience as a public health researcher, evaluator, strategic planner for a range of programs that focus on substance use disorder, HIV, and chronic diseases. Anna's work contributes to systems transformation that bring progress toward health equity. She has conducted evaluations with states and individual organizations and provided technical assistance to increase coordinated care for behavioral health, develop discussion guides for health departments to use to identify where stigmatizing language for health conditions of substance use disorder and HIV can be addressed, and develop rubrics to identify pathways and progress in implementing best practices related to the treatment of opioid use disorder. She recently wrote about factors that evaluators can consider when engaging people with lived experience in the health area. If you have, uh, if you'd like to find it, it's on our website. Um, Anna will help those who want to use evaluation to develop health equity and substance use treatment to identify strategies that focus on changing the system so that it can better support people who need treatment. I'll pass it now to Anna to lead the webinar. Thank you, my son. Um, I'm excited. Thank you for everyone um, who's joining here today. I'm excited to talk about this topic and excited to know that there's others out here who, who are interested in this topic as well. So our agenda today, um, I'm going to set the stage for talking about health equity and opioid use disorder by talking about each of them first and then go into a discussion around systems thinking and then go into um, a mode of thinking about how to develop strategies to promote health equity for OUD. So this question, uh, how do we identify how to achieve health equity for people with opioid use disorder? This is the driver for the content of the webinar today. And I'm going to focus how to direct our attention to the system rather than the individual when we think about this. And I just want to point out our webinar today is not really enough time to review all the various systems that impact people with OUD and to investigate all the forms of structural discrimination. So I'm just hoping to set a landscape to get us thinking. Um, I'm not trying to provide a blueprint, but there's a lot to, to build on here, and I hope it gives us something to reflect on and respond to, and I look forward to the discussion at the end of the presentation. So please do um, put your questions in the chat and any thoughts you have. So to get us started, I want to talk about what is equity because it's a term that's getting used a lot. And here's the definition that community science is using. And you can see from this uh, illustration, 
in order for equity to be present, people need to have fair access to resources, to opportunities to reach their full potential, their own full potential. And they not only need access, but also the rights to those resources and opportunities that make that possible. And furthermore, the conditions need to be present for people to be able to actually take advantage and use them. And then finally, while doing so, people need to be free of discrimination to obtain the resources and opportunities. And those are granted in institutions and the law. So when we talk about equity, we also acknowledge the role of power in being able to realize all of these things, because those who have power have influence over all of these factors that are leading to achieving equity. So in terms of uh, what causes health inequity um, to begin with, Structural racism is so important for addressing health equity. Structural racism, as you know, uses tools of laws, public policies, practices, and the way they're crafted through structural racism results in the fact that some benefit from structural racism. In other ways, in other words, it gives advantages to some racial groups and disadvantages to other racial groups. And those who benefit end up with better places to live, they get better education, they get better jobs, they have safer and cleaner environments, they get better health care. And those who do not benefit, they experience more harms in their neighborhoods, they don't have access to quality health care, education, um, jobs, they have a lack of space to enjoy life. So all of those things are the things that make up what we call the social determinants of health, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, which are the conditions in the environments where people are born, they live, they learn, they work, they play, they worship, they age. Um, and that all affects health functioning as well as outcomes and risks. And so what I wanna point out is that structural racism is the thing that can negatively impact social determinants of health. And those determinants are not in themselves positive or negative, but when there are differences in those social determinants of health, it means that not everyone has access, capacity, and rights. To, so to go back to the health equity, what is health equity? Um, so when we see the difference or disparity in health status, we know that there's inequity. And um, structural racism is the one of the most powerful, maybe most pervasive form of structural discrimination, because it is about having access conditions and rights. And it works through those laws, policies, and practices. And it cooperates through multiple systems um, that work, uh, that are based in, in race. And it basically takes away freedom from discrimination. So I just want to note, when you're talking about structural racism, you're applying a systems lens. Now I want to go into a framework that we use in terms of describing health equity. And this is at the systems level. So if we're looking at this from left to right, moving left to right, what I want you to notice is that we're not talking about in any individual change. Um, we're not looking at individual change in knowledge or behaviors. We're talking about the system. So we're using resources, expertise, partnerships, other supports you have um, to design strategies or initiatives in order to disrupt structural racism for the populations that have been historically disadvantaged. And we do that by transforming public policies, institutional practices, um, norms, and, and it can involve multiple systems that add up or cumulatively deny or limit access to opportunities and resources. And we also, on the other hand, strengthen the capacity of communities affected by disparities to frame issues and drive solutions. If that's in place, we're making progress towards racial equity, and that improves the social determinants of health. So those are, again, those conditions where people are. Um, 
If those social determinants of health improve, we can see reductions in disparities and improvements in health equity. And so this, again, is using that systems lens to just unpack and understand and account for the influence of structural racism. That's a starting point in our evaluation efforts aimed at improving health equity. And it is imperative to get to this systems approach to make a change for population level in health equity. And, and I know that many people, including myself, have started at the point of social determinants of health to try to direct strategies there. Um, but I wanted to encourage us to go back to structural racism as a starting point, even though it might seem pretty large and daunting. And we'll start talking about that in the context of opioid use disorder. So I wanna start talking about the context of racism in terms of opioids and opioid use disorder. Um, so racism has been a player for centuries um, when we're talking about opioids. In the mid 19th century, the British Opium Wars um, started when, they, when the British grew opium poppies in Indian lands that they colonized and intentionally marketed the opium, opium in China to foster addiction so that they could leverage trade. And then given the highly addictive su substance, it wasn't surprising that many Chinese people ended up with opioid use disorder. Then we fast forward to the war on drugs in the 70s, initiated by President Nixon, which was marked by criminalizing use and distribution of drugs rather than seeing substance use disorder as a medical issue. Um, it legitimized incarcerating large numbers of black and brown people for use as well as distribution. We come closer to our present day with the rise in pharmaceutical use of opioids for pain that started around uh, in the 1990s to, to rise um, much more. So there was increased prescribing without key to the propensity for these opioids, these pharmaceutical opioids, to become addicted. And that's a large factor in why patients and people with access to their prescriptions developed opioid use disorder and resulted in uh, overdose deaths. And I just want to remind us that this started with a high concern for white patients, they who were experiencing pain. Pharmaceutical grade op opioids were being prescribed in high doses to alleviate their pain, while Black patients' pain was not well attended to, and they were less exposed to the pharmaceutical form of opioids, which led, ironically, to overdose death rates um, proportionally lower in Black people than among white people at the start of this recent rise of opioid use disorder uh, and overdose deaths. So just to give some um, more recent historical context um, in terms of this progression, and, uh, and I know many people are familiar with this data. Uh, it, this is a visual that comes from the CDC and describes the three waves of opioid overdose deaths um, in recent decades. So in the first wave, we see deaths uh, from commonly prescribed opioids starting in the 90s, as I said. And then as prescription opioids became more difficult to get, heroin flooded the market with being a cheaper alternative. And you see deaths attributable to heroin rising, and that's the second wave. And then the third wave uh, became synthetic opioids um, that came onto the scene, and that was fentanyl, carfentanil, and others. And you see a steep increase in deaths from those starting in 2013 because their potency was was so high. So in terms of the first wave of the opioid crisis, with what it's called, um, with prescription opioids, there was a high concern for deaths in white communities. In the subsequent waves, with heroin and synthetic opioids, deaths spread beyond white communities. And now, Data from the CDC shows that the highest rate of drug overdose deaths is seen among Black men, and this, this data is from 2020. So what you can see is the blue line on the left side points to the, the rise among Black men. 
So with large numbers initially of white people dying from opioids, it came to be seen as a medical problem, um, different from prior decades of, of drug use. And this spurred research and changes in clinical practice. So what we now know um, is that treatment initiation and retention in treatment with one of three FDA approved medications is the best, best approach to prevent death. And mortality and other outcomes as well are, are improved for people while engaged in medication treatment in combination with behavioral therapy to control cravings, withdrawal symptoms, and ultimately death. And these are methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics of each medication today or the efficacy, but I just wanted to make the point that medications themselves are known to be effective to prevent the health outcome we're talking about, to prevent overdose deaths. So now I'm going to bring in the evaluation piece of this, um, of this puzzle. So I'm going to start with a basic type of logic model many of us are familiar with um, to describe what we're talking about. So um, what we can say that is if people with OUD are encouraged to enter into treatment with medication for um, their health condition and they follow the treatment plans and then they furthermore stay engaged and retained in treatment, then deaths or other related negative outcomes will decrease. That's the, that's the thinking, right? Um, and then strategies to help make that happen would be to um, provide education to support people to understand what's available in terms of treatment and availability. And then support people when they um, become clients in treatment programs so that they stay in treatment. So that might mean um, helping with transportation or sending reminders, conducting motivational interviewing to find out what's working for the, for the clients. But the hope generally is that the client's behavior is such that they stay in treatment so that we can avoid this long-term outcome of death. And then in order to measure whether these efforts to address this public health issue have been working, common metrics um, would be to look at the number of those people who are entering treatment and being retained in treatment according to this logic of thinking. Um, so someone who's interested in health equity might be looking for disparities. They may go on to look at the outcome data by client characteristics such as race. Um, which really makes sense because as we saw, there's a higher incidence of death from opioid use among black men right now. So you'd want to look for that. Um, and in order to understand if treatment's being delivered to those currently with the highest burden, black men, the data is analyzed to understand if the outcomes per this logic model lead to the long-term outcome of interest. Yeah. And in other words, are there disparities in treatment initiation and retention by race? So when studied accordingly, the data on retention shows that there are differences in length of treatment stay by race. So there's conclusions um, often written in terms that basically lead to the talking point that black patients drop out of treatment at higher rates than white patients, as you can see from this journal article title. And this is just an example of how it might be framed. Um, and the statement suggests that for us to understand retention differences by race, one might look more at characteristics of those Black patients. Why are they not complying with the best practices or their treatment plans as was designed by the strategy? And then when thinking about strategies to decrease this disparity, one might be led to think about how to focus on the Black clients and just pile on more education, pile on more support to encourage them to stay in treatment. It may not be untrue what these authors are stating, but the title and measurement indicates there's a responsibility and capacity of the person, of that individual. Um, and we're recognizing that substances impair decision-making, but we really underappreciate the power of systems to control freedom of action. 
um, when we're focusing on this individual action. So going back to our original logic model, what if the line of inquiry were adjusted? What if we looked at the health system? Are there enough providers of substance use treatment in communities where Black people live? What if we looked more closely at the type of treatment? Are Black patients more likely to have access to the type of treatment for which there are more barriers to access? So methadone is more onerous treatment, and it's more likely to be found in communities where Black people live compared to buprenorphine, which is available where white people live. Do Black people need to make more difficult choices between getting to work or to treatment? Is treatment delivered in a way that Black patients can trust? And then what if we looked at treatment providers? Are they aware of and practice in a way that's respectful and culturally relevant to Black patients? Have they received appropriate training? What if we looked at the location of the services? Are they in an area that's accessible and safe for Black patients to go to? Is it even safe for them to disclose their substance use? Because we know that they're more likely to be reported to Child and Family Services or to their employers, um, to police. So the main point I'm trying to make here is to ask why. So to look at beyond the individual data and look at the system. And that original logic model of how to reach better outcomes doesn't help us interrogate the system. It really boxes us in to only think about the individuals and their outcomes. And we need to stop measuring individuals if we're going to get to the system level change. And our health equity framework will help us look for those outcomes directly related to structural racism. So let's go back to that. Um, the framework I described in the beginning. So if we use this framing, we can stop focusing at what we can do to change individuals. We can start focusing on strategies that change policies, that change community level factors. Um, so we, we might be looking in terms of disrupting structural racism. We could look at where is there bias and discrimination um, what about factors of criminalization? Um, what about methadone policies and ex accessibility to treatment, um, provider training? And we can also look at, um, at, at the social determinants of health in terms of what are workplaces like? What are the policies in those workplaces? What is the availability of treatment in the places where people are working and living? Um, is it easy and safe access to treatment? And so this is getting more at the system level, both the current systems as well as the, the historical or past um, systems that are creating barriers um, to equitable access to treatment. It also addresses those mental models that uh, that providers hold, that communities hold, that people hold for themselves. Um, and, and with those mental models, there's a lot of assumptions that are made. And much of it is based on if someone did something wrong, that maybe they didn't take care of themselves in terms of their substance use, which led to a substance use disorder. And that is really trying to be interrogated here in terms of changing those mental models, which can then change systems. And I also want to talk about, so I named a few things in the social determinants of health arena here, but um, as we know, structural racism affects um, many of these factors, um, employment, education, et cetera. Um, so all of that needs to be addressed because in order to have good treatment outcomes and health outcomes, we need to have um, we need to have all the things that improve social determinants of health because otherwise they any negative social determinants of health will undermine any efforts for treatment outcomes. They work together. Um, and just as an as a parallel example, many people bring up diabetes. Um, so people with diabetes. We know that insulin 
is not the full solution. It is the treatment. But if people with diabetes didn't have access to foods that support or manage their diabetes, then the medication on its own wouldn't be fully effective and sustainable. Similarly here, there's more to it than just having the medication. I don't want to give the impression that that's it. So in terms of systems thinking, so this is what where I'm, I'm getting us to. So by changing the focus of the narrative, um, of retention from those who drop out of treatment. So those outcomes, um, when we're looking, not looking at structural factors to the factors within the system that don't facilitate or support retention, then we start applying a systems approach to designing strategies, which will reach better health outcomes. And we can say that an anti-racist approach necessitates a systems approach. And ultimately, we could see conclusions if we're using this approach. Instead of that headline that I showed you before, the journal title, we might see something different um, and, and have something like, this number of providers deliver care that Black patients can trust. And that's different. And, and, and when you're thinking about the strategy, you might think if you're not reaching the percentage that is appropriate for you, to reach the better health outcome. The strategy here needs to change in terms of how can trust be um, improved. So with this type of data in hand, we can then go on to examine who stays in treatment, but not before, not before we examine the systems factors um, so that we are addressing health equity. And again, that's fair access to resources and opportunities, rights to those resources and opportunities, conditions that need to be present, and whether people are free of discrimination. And the systems level thinking leads us to understand that opioid use disorder is not only a disorder of the person, it's a disorder of the systems that led us there. And it's those systems that we need to focus our attention on changing and measuring. So you might be wondering, so what parts of the system should we change? Um, and, and I want to encourage us to think in this way so we can identify some of those systems changes. But I also want to draw attention to this, um, this, this great study done by um, the Graken Center for Addiction at Boston Medical Center. And they understood that there was not enough information to inform an anti-racist approach to substance use disorder treatment. And they launched a study focused on learning how to make addiction treatment more appealing, effective, and equitable for Black patients. So they held six focus groups with Black people with lived experience of substance use disorder. So that could be themselves um, or having family members who had a substance use disorder. And, um, and findings from this research team identified eight recommendations, four ways treatment organizations can make in efforts to create treatment that's more appealing, effective, and equitable for Black patients. So I'm just going to go through these briefly. Um, but you can see that requiring leadership commitment and holding leaders accountable, changing organizational operations to promote equity, changing the way that staff are hired, trained, and supported, empowering and supporting patients, reshaping addiction treatment with a less punitive, more strength-based approach, addressing trauma, and removing barriers to the receipt of mental health care, and then addressing the social or practical barriers to care. And again, this helps guide us as researchers and evaluators to identify what to measure and whether there are changes in these aspects, because these are at the system level um, that need to happen to get to health equity. Some other recommendations I can think of is, um, you know, thinking about methadone regulations. And we know that methadone is more onerous, but it's in the communities where Black people are. So can there be different um, policies around how onerous this type of treatment is and make it less burdensome so that 
people can stay in treatment because that is the ultimate goal. Um, and then making sure that treatment is available, including uh, buprenorphine, not having treatment deserts as we talk about. And how can we incentivize primary care providers to offer the buprenorphine, and which is mostly in the white communities, um, how can we offer incentives for them to also practice in the communities where opioid use disorder is rising in the Black communities? Um, we know that insurance parity for behavioral health has long been an issue and still needs to be more completely addressed. Um, we know for a long time there's been de uh, criminalization and policing of Black people, so how can we um, change policies to lower decriminalization, um, see substance use disorder as a health condition, and um, interestingly, deaths of despair came around when um, to explain why white people were um, getting opioid use disorder, uh, but it wasn't around when when heroin was. Uh, being seen in Black communities for quite a few decades. We can also look to employers. So employment opportunities, we know, have long been affected by racism. But if people had access to employment, it would support their recovery, as well as possibly not having to, um, to, to sell drugs for a living. Employers can also create environments where they're not punitive about people having a history of using drugs, or they can become uh, recovery friendly, where employees can take time employees can take time to go to treatment appointments in a way that's not punitive to their employment status, especially if that means for them they need to go to a um, methadone clinic on a daily basis. So they don't need to sacrifice getting to work versus getting to treatment. And I'm sure there's other um, recommendations we could discuss here, but those are just a few. So what I've been framing in the context of improving outcomes for opioid use disorder is to conduct evaluation in service of equity. And this is based on work that community science has done with the Kellogg Foundation. You can find the practice guide series on our website. And I know that there's many people who are doing great work to shine a light on stigmatization, discrimination, racism related to substance use on the one hand. And then there are evaluators and researchers who are measuring disparities in treatment and in deaths. And what I'm suggesting is that the two could come together under this framework of evaluation in service of equity, where we redirect measures to the system so that strategies are therefore also aimed at addressing the system's factors that are underlying the disparities in outcomes. Because if we do that, we will also be able to gain a deeper understanding of the power shifts that need to happen. And that will be the foundation for what many people want to achieve, both newer and stronger partnerships and collaborations across sectors and across people who have been advantaged and disadvantaged. These partnerships and collaborations are what are needed for increased advocacy to move the levers that lead to change. And change hopefully at the level of policies and practices that contribute um, to help inequity. Remember that this approach and being explicit in addressing structural racism identifies where changes are needed. So they're needed at that level and policies, partnerships, the systems level. So finally, I hope you all take away that equity is in a constant state of change. We need to focus on the systems level. We need to focus on the drivers of health inequity um, being structural racism. We need to conduct evaluations that ask the questions and probe to find where improvements to strategies are needed to advance health equity. And by doing so, we can be the researchers and evaluators who use our methods of inquiry to put the focus on systems change, starting with the way we plan and design our evaluation so that our measures are also focused on the outcomes that make a difference in health equity.
So with that, I want to pause. I want to thank everyone for listening and I want to see what questions are coming up um, in terms of the content I provided, but also I would love to hear um, if this framing is useful to you, how would you use it? Um, what else have you done to try to move towards strategies at the systems level for opioid use disorder, substance use disorder more generally? Um, how it might be leading to health equity. I'll pause to see if there's questions coming up in the chat. There, there is a long, uh, nice long question. Um, shall I read it out and then you can answer? Okay. There's some context to the question. It says, um, I, su I fully support this from Leslie Wood. Thank you so much. I fully support that all, all that you said, and I know the problem is increasing for Black folks and decreasing for white folks in my community as well. However, I have noticed in my own research that similar patterns of inequity follow with extremely poor unhoused folks of any race. I also see that over time, even those who do receive treatment lack the support they need post-treatment and are often not able to sustain their recovery. Any ideas on how we can extend appropriate equity and support through the po through and post treatment? Thank you so much for drawing your attention to these issues. Yeah, thanks for this question, Leslie. Um, I so much agree with you because uh, all best intentions and then um, post treatment, people are in the environments that they're in are facing all the inequities in the in the world that they face. Um, my suggestion would be just to, to go back to that initial framing the logic model and to extend it further out. So it doesn't have to end with um, with treatment. So you're saying, I think if I'm, I'm understanding you, so it doesn't end with when they, how long they're in treatment, but it extends out in terms of other factors. So I think you could still frame it that way as being part of the outcomes and then interrogate again with questions of why, what are the systems level factors at play that do or do not sustain recovery um, for, for people in the communities where they are. But again, focusing on, on the systems level factors, interrogating those rather than being about the people um, that may or may not be able to maintain their recovery. Um, another question comes from Elizabeth Loomis. Can you elaborate on what key partnerships look like? Partner with who? How can we evaluate these partnerships? Um, I think that partnerships can look very different depending on what you're doing and what your strategy is. Um, so in terms of partnering to improve engagement with treatment, if I'm understanding. Um, so those partners might be with community organizations, they might be with healthcare providers, they might be with um, even families, schools, wherever people are found so that we can understand what, um, what people need in terms of trying to engage them with systems level change. So thinking about where are those mental models that we need to change? What are the biases in the community? So we see that many communities don't want substance use disorder treatment in their communities. Um, so what 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 is driving that? What are, what are the biases? What are the fears? So those partners may be a little bit different in terms of trying to get at that. So I think it would just depend on where um where you're trying to focus but given I and mean, i always think that addressing substance use disorder it's almost any anyone in any aspect you can think of is touch um but it's a matter of where do you start but i think that it, partnership can look pretty broad and how do we evaluate these partnerships I guess I'm not sure what you mean about evaluating the partnerships, maybe the quality of the partnerships or how well um, these partnerships are working out. 
Um, you could definitely look at the strengths of the partnerships, whether there is trust, whether there, um, you know, what the process is for building consensus across partners, um, whether conversations are really getting at the real factors, um, or, you know, we can, you know, with any health issue, we can speak in, um, in very positive terms, but we need to get at the real conversations in terms of what are the challenges and what are the real um, underlying factors that are that are not allowing systems level changes. Are we really looking at the, the elements of structural racism, structural discrimination at play here? Um, you received a shout out from Lauren Link saying, this is so helpful. We're a local health department and uh, have a chat going on the side about how we want to apply this framing to our overdose fatality review and opioid settlement committee. Uh, but you have some more questions. Um, and they said, thank you. And then you have other questions. Um, Rebecca McCloskey. And this is helpful. Thank you. Most programs that approach us for assistance with evaluation already have individual level outcomes in mind. Can you point to more examples of system level outcomes to measure and best practices of where you've seen this done well? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's probably true for a lot of people. Um, I've encountered that as well. And um, and as, as someone who's worked in evaluation for a long time, we're often handed those like outcomes that people want to know about um, death. <laughs> and, and how do we shift that conversation? How do we shift looking solely at these outcomes that were handed? And I would say it's not easy, but I would encourage you to use this thinking about, so if we're looking at health equity and I'm assuming that the people you're working with want to address health inequity um, is to go back to your evaluation planning and to start at that, that logic model level. And that's why I started there as well is to, that's what's boxing us in into thinking about individual level outcomes. And if we go back and reframe the full logic model to include those deaths, but further down the line, but what we're looking at initially is not um, not behavior change that's leading to decreased deaths. It's looking at those systems levels. So if we go back to the all those things that we could be looking at in terms of um, who has access, which providers are trained, um, is there bias, is there trust? And we create a, a logic model or theory of change based on that. And that becomes the measurement framework for what you're doing. It can help change that conversation. And I agree, it's not, it's not easy, but um, with the focus on health equity, I think we just need to keep reminding ourselves, everyone around us, that we can't keep focusing on individual level change because health equity is a system level change. So we need to start there. Um, I have a question that sort of relates to this. And it and my question is, in terms of a context of planning and evaluation, is it possible to have sort of a phased approach where you're asked, let's say you start by asking more why questions and system questions, and then maybe get to the the outcome questions of interest, like, is it a choice? Like, do you have to do one or the, are you recommending one or the other, or can you do both? And is it really more a matter of like staging, let's say of like when you're asking the, um, like the population level outcome questions like deaths or retention and treatment or things like that? I mean, it's, it's a, a practical question, and mm -hmm. I would say probably staging is appropriate, um, but I'm also curious, and I want this to be a discussion to hear what you all think, and um, we assume that even if you have a recommendation as an evaluator, 
uh, in health for a long time, open to, um, to your suggestion as well. I was thinking more in the context of the question that was asked in the sense that like people come with these outcome indicators that they already know that they want. And what I'm hearing is you saying is that like, well, they're not the priority questions, let's say, like the priority is really understanding the system. But is it a do you have to make the choice? Or are you recommending people make a choice and only focus on the systems questions? Or what place to do these kind of like uh, more traditional outcome measures play in the evaluation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose you don't have to make a choice. I think the the pitfall, I guess, or harm that could be done in not making the choice early is, again, getting locked into harmful narrative when mm -hmm. you're when you're producing data that leads you to start thinking about strategy and improvement, that's again, going back to a place that isn't going to help you change the system. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe a parallel process to ease people into it, but, um, but I would focus more on getting people into, into a different way of thinking early so that they're they're not, they're strategizing differently. And we all want mm -hmm. to end up at the end of the day, making a difference in the actual, um, the actual programming and, mm -hmm. um, and treatment offerings. So, so if we are able to do that in, in a parallel way, I would say yes, um, but being cognizant of where harmful narratives might lie as well. Yeah, I, I really appreciated your examples of alternate kind of measures of like the black people trust their providers is like as like a good measure of the success of a program as much as you know uh, other things that may like you said promote more of a false narrative of oh they don't come to treatment mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. um, right yeah. and you don't see um you know traditional evaluations met you know having trust as a real you know central piece of measurement um, mm -hmm. but it knowing that that is a key element of what's driving people to to engage or not engage in treatment we need to start there too to say what are the strategies to build this trust and is it working mm -hmm. yeah i realize we're a little limited with the q a in terms of discussion so but if people do have other comments or thoughts on this topic please feel free to put them in the q a um, there was a question also about the role of advertising pharmaceutical drugs on TV and, you know, whether this plays a role in, um, in uh, I think, um, what's not stated in the question, but in terms of um, substance use disorder. Um, this is coming from Chanel Payne, so thank you. And they, and they say some other countries do not advertise drugs on television. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... I don't have a, um, I don't have anything to 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 back that up, but um, but it's a good point in terms of the rise in use of pharmaceutical opioids. Um, it could be a factor. Mm -hmm. Right. I found it very interesting how you said, you know, the deaths of despair is not a concept that's applied to communities of color. Um, so much in terms of uh, explanatory model for why the substance use is happening in the first place. Um, would you want to talk any more on that or do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, you know, just from a personal perspective, I've worked in substance use prevention and treatment realms for a long time and, um, and faced a, a lot of statements that people would say in terms of, um, you know, what do people need to change in 
about themselves or about parenting or about, um, you know, motivation um, to stay healthy and things like that, um, which, you know, we all know all the moralizing around substance use. And, and when there was the rise in opioid use um, disorder among white people, and then this concept of deaths of despair came about to explain why were people dying um, in white communities? Why were they using opioids? Why were they facing high numbers of overdose? It became despair because jobs were going away, um, because they didn't have hope, um, et cetera, um, which is very sympathetic and, and quite a good framing for people and why they might turn to, um, might find themselves using drugs and might find it in their communities. Um, but it just was not used until that time. And, and I think that if we are to say that there were deaths of despair, then deaths of despair should have existed for a long time. So that could be the explanation forever about substance use, not just recent substance use. So I, I would like to see it personally used either more broadly to explain all substance use or um, to acknowledge that it is limited to certain types of substance use because empathy is only given for despair for certain um, users of, of drugs and, and time of use. Mm -hmm. I welcome anyone to to say say something uh, that's different because I think it's it's been a, a topic that's been discussed quite a bit. Has anyone commented in the chat about any suggestions they have for creating more health equity around um, around OUD? I would love to hear if anyone else has done work in this area. No, we haven't had any chats in a, in a bit. But um, I was going to ask also about, um, you mentioned sort of among the policy solutions, one that you touched on that I wondered if you had, since we have a bit of time to elaborate on, might be um, methadone policies, saying that they're very onerous, yet they are more available in Black communities. So I wondered if you could sort of elaborate on that. Oh, sure. As um, examples of how they could be less onerous and um, and would that really help fill gaps in access to treatment if they were more uh, less onerous? Mm -hmm. So uh, methadone has been around for a long time um, and it is it dispensed in federally regulated settings and administrated on a daily dose basis. So people have to come in every day for their medication um, and be monitored. And so there's testing and all of that. And um, when buprenorphine became available, that's by primary care providers so that they can, people can go to their PCP's office and receive that. So the, what we've seen happening, the research is showing now pretty recently is that where you find methadone is in the places where Black people can access treatment. There is much more methadone availability there. Um, buprenorphine is less available there, but buprenorphine is ease of access is so much higher and you don't have to go for daily dosing. Um, and so there are these two types of treatment. We're looking at engagement with treatment as it primary driver for reducing deaths. But if some people have um, have to do more to stay in treatment, it makes sense that their rates of death might be higher um, because they're facing more barriers to that treatment. So mm -hmm. there, you know, during the pandemic, there was some relaxation of rules around methadone. And there's still a lot of conversation we know happening around um, relaxing those those rules, but it's not at the at the level where buprenorphine is, and um, 
and can it be mm-hmm. or or do we you know strategize on just getting the buprenorphine providers into these communities where they haven't been before um leslie has another comment they say suggestion may have already been alluded to ask people who need help with substance use what they need instead of determining it for them because what works for suburban white folks does not always work for poor and or non-white folks. Meet them in the community and have discussions about what is missing and what they would like to see or how we can support them. That's a great suggestion, Leslie. I wish everyone was doing that. And I think very much in spirit with the, this uh, talk. So we're just about a time. Anything else you want to add, Anna? before we wrap up? No, just thank you for attending. I'm, I'm so glad there's people who have been interested in the topic and um, engaged in the discussion. And please do follow up if you want to talk further. Thank you for um, being here today. And everyone will receive a link to the recording today if you're interested in, in having it. And thanks, Mason, for facilitating as well. And Andrea for monitoring all in the background. Thanks everyone. Have a good day. Bye, you too.